And I'm going to introduce our wonderful uh, Executive Director of Diversity Leadership Alliance, Joanna Deshay. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I am going to wait until everybody kind of comes in just a little bit. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing this. And uh, good morning. Deep breath in, right? That's the one thing we were talking about that, Malia. Um, we talked about grateful. You know what I'm grateful for this morning? That I get to do just that. Take that deep breath in and take it out without um, any issue, without any trouble, without needing any assistance. When did you ever think that that is something um, that you would be grateful for? In these COVID times, I am grateful for breath. That is my gratefulness this morning. And as we approach Thanksgiving, that is something that I want you all to really be mindful of and really in this space think of what am I grateful for? Uh, not just for the food and the pies and all the yumminess that we are going to all enjoy, but what am I truly grateful for? And it starts with something as simple as breath. Uh, welcome to Diversity Leadership Alliance and welcome to our uncomfortable conversations that ignite change. This is a dialogue series that we're very proud of. It is something that we started as a way to have conversations and not just conversations that we um, really wanted to just um, have people have, but conversations that really mattered. This dialogue series is all about listening. This dialogue series is about listening and learning and was created as a way to have conversations that mean something. Our desire is for people to walk away, for people to walk away feeling like they have some tools, some critical tools in their arsenal that they can begin to have some soul searching. They can begin to have some soul healing and really begin to have some emotional repair because the idea of diversity and inclusion and equity is difficult work. But just because the work is hard doesn't mean you shouldn't do the work. So as we travel down this road, as we take this journey together, I want you all to realize that we need each other. And what we realize here at DLA is in order for this work to happen, in order for true progress to be made, we have to all be in this together. It's gonna to literally take all of us. It's gonna take every race, it's gonna take every ethnicity, every culture, every religion, gender, sexual orientation, and yes, every political affiliation. We don't have all of the answers with DLA, but what we have is this. We have this space, this platform, and this is our safe space for us to have important conversations. And when we come together, we can connect in this meaningful way. And so this is your space. This is your chance to ask questions. This is your chance to get clarity. And really this is your chance to ask those questions that you may not be able to ask in other spaces. So we really wanna make sure that you are open to all of the dialogue that you hear today and that in that openness, you're able to receive. So that's what really today is all about. Um, Brent mentioned it, we just finished up our absolutely amazing two-day virtual conference. And if you attended that conference, would you just in the chat, um, just give us some quick feedback, one or two words about what your experience was at conference. What we're hearing from a lot of you is that you really were moved by what we talked about. Our virtual conference was sponsored by our change agents, SRP, Mayo Clinic, USAA and Cox. And we are so grateful to those change agent sponsors. Without them, we can't do this work. They are really the ones that are pivotal in terms of helping us move you know, the agenda forward and shift the pendulum so we can continue to do this work. Over those two days, we unpacked a lot. We talked about conversations around the trauma of racism. We talked about what it was like to be a man of color in America and how do you navigate through that space. 
We talked about the difference of what it's like to be a co-conspirator versus just an ally. We also unpacked conversations about what it's like to shift the culture within your organization and ended up with a panel on oppression, what it looked like, how it's morphed to modern day and what it means for us for our future. So there were so many wonderful conversations and I hope you joined us and I hope you'll join us next year because the conversations continue in 2021. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Thank you to all of our amazing volunteers, especially our volunteers at USAA that staffed our, you know, our virtual uh, uh, volunteer uh, Zoom that we had where people were, were calling in and Skyping in and Zooming in with questions and issues that they had, because this work is not easy, uh, but we have so many community volunteers that really help us out. So thank you so much. You know, without you, we can't do this work. And so thank you so much for helping us continue to do the work around equity, inclusion, and belonging. So speaking of work, we continue that work today with our amazing and wonderful presenter that will be guiding us through dialogue number four. So dialogue number four today is all around the idea of privilege. And uh, we are going to be talking about uh, what it's like to have it, uh, what it's like to use it. And our conversation is gonna be guided by the wonderful DEI specialist, Malia Dunn. So you're in for quite a treat today. Um, in today's workshop, you, our participants, are going to get a broader understanding of the breadth of differences that really contribute to societal privilege. We're going to explore common unproductive behaviors, and you'll understand kind of the insidious nature of privilege and how it perpetuates systemic racism and how it also perpetuates oppression. Malia is going to introduce you to her embrace model and she'll give you a strategy and several tools for how you can really start to kind of guide your own learning and kind of guide your own journey to help you advance social justice and practice more effective allyship. But before we begin, as you all know, this is a community space and as a community space, we all must be respectful. So what I would like to do is I would like to remind everybody about the rules of engagement. So if you will allow me just a minute, I would like to remind you about our rules. So let me go ahead and share my screen here with everyone. Um, we talked about multitasking here. Okay. So our rules for engagement are quite simple. As we talk, I just want everyone to also listen. That's very important. I'm asking everyone to listen actively and be open to the full spectrum of perspectives. Commit to foster greater empathy. Try very hard to relinquish the need to be right. I know you're like, but my point, my point is so important. I need you to understand my point. You're yes, but try to relinquish that need to be right. Ask questions and seek clarification for understanding. Most importantly, be respectful. Be respectful to our presenter, be respectful to other attendees. And I don't want any one or two individuals to consume or dominate the discussion area, even in the chat. Because what happens is it ends up being distracting. And with that distraction, it takes away from our presenter. And you don't want to miss what Malia has to say, because then someone's so focused on the chat, they go, oh, I missed that important point. Darn it. What did she just say? So you want to make sure that you're not dominating the discussion area. And approach each other with kindness and love. This one is such a simple kind of life rule, but sometimes I think with these community spaces, you have to remind people of that. So approach each other with kindness and love. And as a community space, we've never done it before and we don't want to do it, but I just want to remind people that as a community space, we reserve the right to remove you from the discussion if we feel like it's not being productive and you are being disruptive. 
And the other thing is ask questions. That's what Malia is here for. That's what I'm here for. That's what our co-founder, Marion Kelly, is here for. We want you to ask questions. That's how you learn. And there's no such thing as a silly question or a stupid question or, hey, I don't know this. That's why you're here. If you don't know, ask. We're all here to learn. And the way we're going to do it, because we're in this new webinar format, is ask the questions of the presenter, uh, of the moderator, myself, in the Q&A area. That way we can kind of keep track of it. We can check it out when we've answered your question. And then for things where, you know, you're just kind of chatting back and forth, do that in the chat area. That way we don't miss any of your important questions. Because if you ask the question in the chat area, as the chat moves along, we might miss it and we don't want to miss it. So make sure you're asking the questions in the Q&A area. Um, and the last thing, yeah, the chat area is for you to engage and exchange with each other. Simple community rules, and that's all we ask of you, okay? So <clears throat> I'm going to stop there. And we'll remind you over and over a few times of uh, kind of the rules of engagement as we move forward. Um, so with that, I'm gonna, we laugh because we talk about the fact that we've got a lot of uh, moving parts here on our screen. So, okay, bear with us. All right, so those are the rules, pretty simple. And now to the good stuff. Let me introduce you to today's presenter. Today's presenter is the CEO and founder of Malia Dunn Consulting, Inclusion Embraced. Malia has a 20-year consulting career and is committed to unlearning dominant culture, practices, and shedding what she calls her savior complex and really demonstrating effective allyship. She's a diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist that approaches her work with humility and examination of her own experiences from the cringeworthy to the redeeming. Malia has a BA in speech communication from Penn State University and a master inclusion practitioner certificate from the Center for Transformation and Change. She has done anti-bias education work with the Anti-Defamation League and served in the Peace Corps in Albania. Malia is an unapologetic cat person who simultaneously holds dog people in high regard. DLA family, please give a warm and gracious welcome to the lovely Malia Dunn. Thank you, Joanna. I really appreciate that. Right. Let's let's start off the inclusion space with our, you know, our animal loving people. And I'll say as well, you know, if y'all are out there and you like birds and reptiles and all of that, oh, the nurturing spirit and the connection spirit, I hold you all in high regard and I'm happy to be here with you this morning. So let's start um, my screen share today. And while we're doing that, I encourage you, I, I love that uh, Joanna started with taking a deep breath, right? That is, let's keep doing that. Um, especially when we enter into any experiences that feel uncomfortable, when we can take a couple deep breaths, it helps us stay in the moment. Um, so it's actually a practice that I apply to many things. So it's always great when we see that synergy with what we do. So. As we're, as we're here, um, before we really dig in, I'd like to, you know, do a little work. It's been a week. It's been a month, a year, right? We're in this year of disruption. Um, I want to hold space and honor that we have all had to adjust and change and accept, you know, accept loss and accept differences as we've dealt with the COVID experience. And all of that is very real. Um, and the joy that is in our lives is very real. So I wanna invite each of you to think for just a moment about what is bringing you joy today? What is bringing you joy this week? Um, find something that you can lean into and I'd love to invite y'all to, to put your thoughts on that or you know, your answers in the chat. Um, for me, bringing me joy today, this morning was as I was getting ready, I had some shuffle playing on my phone and I had some, um, just through shuffle, had some really good dance tunes to kind of get some of my energy up. And that always is a great change for me. Uh, new puppy, new puppy not biting. So new puppy love and new puppy learning, right? Our health, ah, fuzzy jacket, that feels, sounds cozy. 
Ooh, Brent, you must be a morning person. You got up and had a swim before we even got here to start this work. Yep, morning coffee is bringing us our joy, our awareness. Fantastic. So as you read what folks are bringing here, um, just notice what's happening in your body. For I will say, share for me, I already have like a different vibe and a different level of happiness and feeling good about seeing, ah, lavender scented lotion, mm, seeing what's going on here. And I think Joanna said it, entering into conversations about diversity, about injustice, about our equity and inclusion efforts. This is serious work. It can be difficult work. Um, and let's bring our positive energy into it to kind of help be a self-care piece as well as to sustain us in the work. Our joy can always be our refueler. So if there are moments where we need to think back, like I'm saying like, oh, tacos, tacos, think back to those, those fuzzy jackets, um, thinking about those things that we can come in to sustain us in that work. So thanks, feel free to keep going with that. Um, and I'm just gonna reaffirm the way we're gonna, I'm gonna invite you to participate in a couple different ways. So we're gonna invite you to use the chat function, which we're already doing. And as you can see here, through a prompt, sometimes it might be I'm prompting and inviting you all to share so we can kind of collectively come together around some concepts and um, freestyle, right? When, when you hear something that you want to respond to or engage with others, that that's that place for chat. We'll be using some polls. So a couple times we'll get to invite your opinion. So you'll be able to see um, where, where you've got some similarities with folks, where you're unique, where, all, you know, how we, how we compare, how we contrast with our peers. Um, please feel free. We'll do a couple times where we'll um, kind of pause presentation for Q&A as well as at the end. Um, but so do use that Q&A section to drop things in. Sometimes we see questions and it's like, I promise we're getting there. And then there could be questions along the way that it's like, you know, we need to kind of give ourselves a timeout, pause and clarify this so that we can move on and keep everyone engaged and on the same page. Um, and I love the rules of engagement. And I have a few that I will invite to add to that. Um, and we will just keep moving on. Just a little bit more about me. Um, yep, Joanna referenced it. I um, consider myself a recovering white savior um, in a way of being very intentional with that. Of Once I was aware of it and it was brought to my attention through some um, brave voices, people who were holding me in some loving accountability to show up in the world the way that I wanted to. Um, but, you know, I didn't have a chance. Look, here as kids, my brother and I are Luke Skywalker and Wonder Woman. Right, we were sure that we were going to save the world um, from the very early days, but those messages got often reinforced through um, our culture, reinforced through our social socialization in this dominant culture, um, dominant white culture. Uh, I am a returned Peace Corps volunteer. I spent uh, two, almost two and a half years in Albania. So, if there are any folks out there that know a little bit of Albanian or some greetings. Um, we're few and far between across the world, but it's always surprising when, when folks come up, but I'd love to see a little greeting or a mirror jest to you. Good morning. Uh, I, I am a human with many privileged identities, um, many that I did not see for a long time. And then once, you know, again, those brave voices with loving accountability were bringing things um, from outside of my perspective into my perspective they started falling like dominoes. And that is when the earth underneath me started to shake and change everything. And I had to, you know, hold on and make the decision of, do I want to, do I want to push forward through this? And I'm grateful that I had folks who were encouraging me to do so um, and stay resilient in that work. I um, mean, that's the lens, right? That's the lens of looking at privilege from a place where I can own it um, and I hope that we'll all be able to do that today too. Oh, hi, I see another RVPC in here. Um, as To own it and recognize it so we understand how it shows up, how it influences and impacts um, our experiences with others. And finally, I'm an aspiring intersectional feminist. So we'll talk a little bit about intersectionality um, because we are all 
complex, complicated, incredibly amazing human beings. Um, and no, no one list of identities could ever encompass all that who we are. Um, so thinking about that intersectionality, I'm recognizing that in the past, my feminism was likely and, and still clouded right through the white lens that I bring to the work, um, but really working to continue to make that a lifelong journey of working through it. And before I wanna go any further, I wanna also express gratitude pulling into our, our morning. I wanna express gratitude to the elders, um, both past and present of the land here that we live on in Arizona. For those of you who are elsewhere, um, I encourage you to, to understand and learn about the history of the land where you work and live. So I just wanna pay my respect and my gratitude and take a deep breath in recognizing that we are here working on the lands of the Hovokam, the Akima Odom and other Odom nations. And in my way of paying respect is really right now to acknowledge that there's so much I don't know about this history. There's so much that I don't know about the indigenous peoples who were stewards and cared for this land um, that we now live on. And it's my responsibility to start learning more. So thank you for that moment. Um, you know, we're gonna buzz through this because Joanna covered it so well. And as she was reading it, I thought, oh, how are we gonna do all that in, in you know, between now and 11? But we're gonna do the best that we can. All right, so I shared, I had a couple additional learning engagements. So when we connect, when, when you come in with a question or there will be times that I'll even ask folks to come on and bring your voices in. And when we do that, do use the raise hand and, and Brent and Joanna will pull you in and we'll pull you up so we can see your face. You'll be part of this experience and you can uh, respond to some of the questions there. So when you do that, we want you to speak from your own experiences. The second one, which is always difficult for me, to listen harder when you initially disagree. So listening to understand versus listening to, when is it my turn? When is it my turn to follow up on that? Um, being open, noticing what is happening in you, like in this mindfulness in our bodies, when do we start to feel knots in our stomach? What is that an indicator of? What's that check engine light about? Or when do we feel a lightness? Like, ah, that was great information. Just notice what's happening in you and pay attention to that because that's how we, how we cue in on what might need more attention. And yep, in between now and 11, we're not gonna get to closure. We're not gonna get everything finished, but we're gonna be on the path. And I hope that um, y'all, if that makes you uncomfortable, I hope we'll take one of those nice deep breaths and work to accept that non-closure and that this is an ongoing journey and things will probably get messy. Um, this point, um, Brent, I would love to bring up our first poll. Um, and that is, as that's coming up for a minute, really thinking about sometimes we see these learning agreements or we see our roles of engagement. We're like, yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. And some of them, yeah, that's hard for me. That's, that's a habit I need to break or that could be a challenge. So I'm inviting y'all to, to put in some what you got here. So we have everyone voting now. We have about 30% of you voting. Mm -hmm. If any of you have ever been on the back end and watching the voting as it goes, it's kind of, it's fun to see the numbers roll in and it's changing. So uh, if you ever have that chance, I hope you enjoy that moment. Mm -hmm. All right. Got a few more answers coming and they're still coming in strong. So I'm sure. gonna, we're gonna keep it open for a little bit. We're almost yeah. at 128 of you. There's 128 of you, so. We're getting there, we're getting there. We're and, at you know, 98. Um, if there are folks who, who are choosing something else, I'd love to hear what that is. So I'd love you to maybe put a, a quick phrase in the chat of sometimes the things that are hard for you in these learning experiences and engaging in difficult conversations. So yeah, if you identify to something else, let, let's hear what that is, because it's probably something that many of us could, could apply and continue to be aware of and work on. 
All right, Malia, I'm going to shut down the poll here and share all the results. There you go. All right. Look at that. Look at that. There's some human nature right there in that listening harder when we initially disagree. It was some human nature and some of our right socialization, some of our uh, um, learning about how to how to operate in this culture. Um, I also see some folks working on that accepting non-closure and the messiness. Ooh, yeah, the messiness, right? How how often we want to just get to the cleaning it up get to the solutions, right? And sometimes the solution, the quick solution is often not the, the solution we need. Sometimes we need to stay in that mess uh, and understand the mess um, and find comfort in it. And then let the solutions kind of evolve and arrive from there. And recognizing that oftentimes the solutions are not our own, but within our group, right? The wisdom of this whole collective group 120 plus folks on here, our collective wisdom is far, far greater than any one of us, any small group of us. Um, here I see a uh, piece in here, one of the, it's hard to not feel defensive even when I want to be open and to learn. Right, so, yeah, I told, yeah, we have to go like, what is this really, you know, what is being brought to me? Mm -hmm. So, all right, we can take down the, those poll results. And, ba, 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 ba. oh, you did, but I'm still seeing it on my end. Sorry about that. Um, and here, what I want us to think about as we enter in, this was a, an agreement or a suggestion that I saw recently in another workshop I participated in. And I think of it as this kind of, um, our, our hygiene, so I think of if you've ever looked at the back of the shampoo bottle or soap bottle and it says lather, rinse, repeat as needed. That's the philosophy, right? Okay, next day, my hair is all oily again, got to get in, I got to lather, rinse, repeat and as needed. So thinking about practice empathy, screw it up, circle back, clean it up, try again as needed, right? And we'll probably need to do this always and always. So. When I saw that, I liked the, I liked the continuity of it, the perpetual nature of practicing empathy, screwing it up, things get messy, we'll keep working through, we'll clean it up, we'll try again. And I invite y'all to, to think about that as we enter the work. So speaking of messy, this is pretty, right? This is pretty mess, but it's messy. Um, we've got another poll for you. So we're gonna go into, Poll number two. All right. Would love to hear from y'all. Who do you think the world is made for? Right-handed folks or left-handed folks? And I will say, I bet, yes, there are folks out there who want to acknowledge all you ambidextrous, ambi the people who use both. <laughs> um, absolutely, there's some truth in that. Um, and so just want you to think about how the world is designed, how the world is made and kind of move through there. Look at where around, got 88 of our group coming through. I don't think y'all are gonna be too terribly surprised when we show these results. Um, Right, yes, and absolutely. So in a moment, we're gonna invite, I'd love to hear some folks who are left-handed, if you are willing to, if you so desire to share a little bit about your experience or something that you have um, faced through your lifetime that was really frustrating or saying like, you know what? Most people don't even have to think about this. So, all right. I think we can probably wrap up that, that poll and share the results. Here we go. Good old, good old, yeah, some, some strong leaning on those right-handed folks that, that have to have to face the work here. So let me kind of pop out of here. And do we have some folks? I'm seeing some folks put some things in the uh, in the chat, but I'd love to have some live voices. I'd love some 
some additional, you're probably at this point, I've been talking for a long time, you're probably ready to hear from somebody else. So I'd love to have some, some folks come on in and share some experiences. At All right, we're gonna welcome Angela Tate. She's coming on down. <laughs> Let's see here. I'm gonna remove your... Angela should be with us now. Good morning, Angela. Maybe if I know we're all good at forgetting to unmute ourselves. Yeah, make sure you unmute yourself oh. and unhide yourself, Angela. There we go. I'm asking her to unmute. Good morning, Angela. You just muted yourself, Angela. And feel free to check out some of the stories that are happening in the chat as well. I'm seeing, well, that's, I don't want to take anything from Angela's story. So Angela, we need you to unmute so that you can talk to everybody. Here, my brother was left-handed. We'd have to see. Or, or it might not be Angela. It says there's an M, there's an M by your name, even though it says Angela Tate. So yeah, you're unmuted now. So hi. Good morning. She might be having technical difficulties. She might be. So <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in as our proxy left-hander, because I am a left-hander. Um, Sorry, Angela, we're, we're, I'm not sure. See, we had some great things in the chat where people said that they had to learn both. Um, I write with my left hand, but I do my sports with my right. Um, and I don't hold my paper really crazy like and twist my arm around like a lot of lefters, left handers do. So I was allowed to write with my left hand. Um, mm -hmm. But because of the norm of everyone using their right hand, like when we were doing physical education class, I learned everything else with my right. Right. Um, and I'm hearing, you know, potentially there were there were instructors that that really that recognized, it, but still went to that default. Oh, we got a voice in. Yeah, hi. This is this is Michelle. I think I'm signed in under Angela because she invited me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So I think learning learning, yes, learning sports hi. was always an issue. Hi, because having to like translate when you're trying to learn a sport and they're saying, okay, now take your right hand to do this. And so it's always that extra few seconds to translate into doing it with your left hand. Yeah. Always, I think made it a little harder to learn things. And my great grandmother wouldn't teach me how to, how to crochet or knit. Cause she said it was just too hard to translate. Right. Thank you, Michelle. And we have the real Angela Tate, I think, joining us, possibly. I also, so, and. Would so, the real Angela Tate please? I don't know. Well, the real, the okay. For disclosure, there's like six or seven Angela Tates. So yes. she shared her link. <laughs> yes. That's great. Okay. This is the real Angela Tate. But I, don't, I didn't make any messages in the chat, so I'm not sure who that was. Okay. Okay. The real Angela Tate has a picture up. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Yeah, I'm thank seeing you. in the chat. I'm seeing in the chat folks saying, um, "I was forced, right? I was forced to be left right-handed. I was forced to use it." Um, I know folks who have talked about how they, uh, the left-handers, always had the perpetual smudge on their hand from writing with the pencil and get picking up the lead or the whiteboard, right, or chalkboard, saying like. If I came up to the room and was invited by the instructor to do some things, I had to be careful that I wasn't erasing what I wrote with my hand as I went, right? So, so many differences. I've uh, heard power tools. Power tools are mostly used for, created for, for right-handed. You know, we all can probably imagine the scissors. I know most left-handed folks will say trying to cut with right-handed scissors with your left hand. It, the scissors don't work. Um, I'll date myself from my time. There were, um, in my elementary school, I can remember there were the scissors that had the red lining were the right ones and the ones that had the green lining were the left ones. And there were always a, like two left-handed scissors in the room. And sometimes they weren't used. And I, you know, I once had to use the left pair. It didn't, it didn't work so well. So it was kind of that piece of understanding, oh, computer mouse, right? 
you have to find things that are specifically made in that design adjustment. Yeah. Yeah. So I bring this up really just to, to kind of lay the simple, basic concept of privilege as the freedom from having to think about barriers, mm -hmm. right? So right-handed folks, we very, very rarely need to worry about the tool or where we're sitting at the dinner table or what we're doing. That's just something that doesn't come up and face us day in and day out. We don't have to think about it. And when we don't have to think about things, we don't really see them. And so this is kind of just the early starter way to get us talking into that, that concept of difference and privilege. So let's see. I, I, I'm still one of those people who also likes to have my paper notes as we go here. So I think what we'd like to do now is, um, Brent, is this where we want to pause and, and see our video? We are there. We are yeah. I am kicking you out. <laughs> and here we go, everybody. To social justice, there's one word that can stop almost any conversation dead in its tracks. Privilege. <laughs> If you've ever stumbled into a conversation about racism, you've probably heard the phrase white privilege, which has been ruffling feathers since the phrase became commonplace in the 1960s. The concept of privilege isn't limited to race, but when it's brought up, no matter who you're talking to, too often the response isn't very friendly. Privilege? How dare you? So what exactly is privilege and why does talking about it make so many people so angry? Privilege is defined as a special right or advantage available only to a particular person or group of people. In the context of social inequality, it means that some groups of people are treated better than others based on their race, gender, class, sexuality, or physical ability. Now here's the thing about privilege. Everyone has it. You've got privilege, you've got privilege, we've all got privilege! So for example, as an able-bodied person, I've never struggled to find a bathroom that I can comfortably access or gone out to lunch with friends to only realize that I can't find a parking spot to get into the restaurant or even fit through the door. When I turn on my favorite show, I can watch and enjoy with ease because I don't require captions or descriptive narration, which too many shows don't have. So why does talking about privilege make some people angry? I think there are a number of reasons why privilege can be difficult to talk about. Number one. When people hear the word privilege, it feels like they're being blamed. When we use privilege in everyday conversations, we hear phrases like, X is a privilege, not a right. So the vocabulary makes it seem like it's something that you don't deserve. Combine that with the fact that conversations about social inequality tend to be very passionate, it's easy to understand why someone might be upset when check your privilege comes up. No one wants to be the bad guy. And for some people, the concept of privilege feels like they're being blamed for something that's out of their control. And when you think about it that way, sure, that's bound to make someone angry. Number two, privilege makes people feel guilty. Talking about privilege is not meant to make you feel guilty. Guilt isn't productive. Acknowledging it isn't about shame, it's about challenging the system that perpetuates inequality. The existence of privilege isn't my fault or your fault, but understanding and acknowledging it is an important first step in working to make a world where these obstacles don't exist. However, ignoring the problem or refusing to acknowledge the problem exists just allows it to continue and thrive. Number three. Anger is a defense mechanism. For some people, talking about privilege feels like they're being attacked, or worse yet, that their privilege is going to be taken away. In reality, privilege describes things that everyone should experience. For example, as a straight person, I don't encounter people passing judgment when I'm affectionate with my husband in public. That's not a bad thing. It should be that way for everyone, no matter their sexual orientation. Number four, they just don't understand privilege. The thing about privilege is it's kind of hard to see. It's like when a horse has those blinders on. They can see what's in front of them, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in the peripheral that they can't see. As wonderful as it would be for everyone to be treated fairly and equal no matter who they are, that's just not the world we live in. Privilege doesn't mean you're rich, a bad person, have had everything handed to you, or have never had challenges or struggles. It just means that there are some challenges and struggles that you won't experience because of who you are. So when you've lived your whole life with something, it's hard to understand what it's like for those without. Now, it's impossible for me to guarantee that every time privilege is brought up, it's justified, or that everyone talks about these issues in a responsible way that's free of name calling or personal attacks. 
And unfortunately, if you've ever had a particularly nasty encounter that included the word privilege, then you might be turned off forever. But if you want to support equality for everyone, which I hope is why you're watching this show, it's important to remember that these conversations are inherently tough but necessary. And the discomfort or anger you may feel when talking about or understanding or acknowledging your privilege pales in comparison to the oppression that those on the other side of the coin deal with every day. So if you ever had difficulty talking to someone about privilege, or maybe you had trouble understanding it or even acknowledging it, tell us about it in the comments below and we'll see you next week right here on Decoded. In our last game. Great, great. Thank you so much, Brent, for getting that going. I will get back into my own screen share. And I will be sharing that link just shortly, everybody, so do not worry. Perfect. So I will say when I when I was looking through, um, put together put together my my agenda and was working on it, we were looking for like what could be a great video that we could use, really, you know, making sure we're bringing multiple voices into this space. And so when I watched this, watching uh, Francesca Ramsey, who also goes by Cheska Lee, um, she's got a really impressive. Uh, portfolio of videos and connected with MTV Decoded, but also on her own. So I know you can, if you're an Instagram person, if you're a Twitter person, like she's got stuff out there that always makes me learn, but always makes me smile, right? So she talks there about how if you've had a crappy conversation and a really, and it goes really poorly, you might be turned off forever. That is really not at all what we want. We want to be able to acknowledge the discomfort because it won't be easy but come to a place where we're nurtured to learn um, and hold space for that discomfort, but not to the point where it's like, whoa, that was too much, push too far, I'm out of here, see you around, goodbye, good luck with that work, right? That's not what we want. We wanna continue to connect and build that community. So also what's, in, what's great about programs like this is reinforcement. So we're gonna see some similar things as I work through from kind of affirming um or you know francesca's really affirming some of the things that i said and i'm you know responding to things that she said so i'm excited to have us work through that yeah. so she kind of defined privilege and here just going from you know quick online pieces when we it's a right or an immunity granted as a particular benefit advantage or favor and also that in in the verb form it's actually giving that to someone or you know prompting someone have granting that but when we look at it through our social justice, our equity lens, we really start to think about how it con connects to our identities, how it connects to our social and cultural forms of power. Also, all of these things that existed and were created before we were here, we were not responsible for the creation, but we today, if we wanna see it change, do have an obligation to working toward the change. Um, and it's really when we know when we're experiencing inequality, Oh, we know, right? Think, think about your moments and times where you know that there was a time where something was unfair to you. We know that in our bones, we can feel that. So just as strongly as we can feel that is how strongly we don't see our privilege, right? She had the, she had the blinders concept. This is like, yep, got my, little, got my little mask on. And it's hard to see by design. Right, by design, because now that we're seeing it, we want to create changes and systems don't want to change, right? Sometimes we as humans don't want to change either, right? Oof. But we want to see it so we can act on it. Um, let's see. So there was a, oh, great. You put the video link in. Um, Brent, would you also throw in the link for the handout? Um, I know that you were working to send it out earlier and Sometimes, sometimes we have link, link whoopsie doodles. Sometimes that happens, but we got our link going here. This is a handout for you to, you know, kind of open it, check it out, give it a scan. You can spend more time on it later, but really this is about starting to assess and starting to examine kind of our identity or, you know, our inventory. Where do I hold privilege? Where do I not, right? She said, we all have it but it looks different for every one of us. Um, so we look at this and that identity inventory, I invite you to like check it out. And I, again, I wanna reiterate as I did like no one worksheet, no, even if this list was longer, cause this is a short one in my opinion, even if this list is longer, 
none of that will ever, ever um, truly capture the essence of everything that we are. Um, but we're gonna start looking at it and trying to look at this space. So we can think about our identities in ways where we look at our intersections, right? Intersectionality, uh, phrase brought to us by Kimberly Crenshaw. She's got a phenomenal TED talk about intersectionality. Um, and it's really looking at our complexity and how our privilege can compound, right? When we've got layers, I liked on the video, she showed like they're removing bar graphs, if you notice that happening on the side. So it can compound both in our privilege and it can also compound in our marginalization. Um, there are times when it's valuable for us to zoom in and talk and look like, let's just talk about race. Let me just talk about my whiteness. Let me understand how my whiteness is showing up. And then there, or let me just focus in and talk about my class. How has it, you know, growing up in a middle-class home, how was I socialized in, through that lens, right? And then we look at it like the gemstones and the diamonds that we are from every different lens makes up who we are. Um, want to show another chart that gives further, uh, some further thoughts around this where we can also think of belonging and othering. So you might've heard that language recently, you know, when we are in our privileged identities, we have that feeling of belonging um, and potentially in our marginalization, there's that feeling of being othered, being, you know, set aside, not thought of, but this happens on a spectrum, right? So if I think about this and I'm going to use a little annotating option here, if I think about see looking at class status, upper and middle class, you know, on the top it's showing privilege. I probably exist, mm, mm, maybe here, right? Mm, you know, in a place of of middle class, you know, middle class kind of moving up, maybe even more at that center. Um, if I think about um, my whiteness, there is no denying it. I I am. My skin tone is white. I grew up in a neighborhood that was predominantly white. My town was predominantly white. Right. I got. I, my messages and socialization is what it meant to be a go white girl was strong. And I've had to really work to undo that, recognize what if that was valuable and what if it was harmful? But so thinking about this as we look, and I will say some of the language on this slide particularly is not always the language I would use, um, but we might find ourselves, you know, here people with disabilities, that can change at any moment, right? We, we, have an accident, break our leg, and all of a sudden we're walking with our crutches. And it's like, oh, I really took for granted how great it was to just not have to have a support, not have to figure out how I'm getting up and down these stairs. So some of these things change over time and some of them are, are um, more fixed, immutable, if you will. So let me make sure I clear this so our little check marks don't follow us to our next screen. Malia, I'm going to interrupt while you're doing that really fast. I'm going to ask Catherine. I'm Catherine. I'm going to bring you live now to ask your questions because you have some really great questions here that I think everyone will benefit around uh, around this. So here she comes. Hopefully, I'm going to try. She's, we have a little lag in there, everyone, when we okay. when we have these. Welcome, Catherine. I'm looking a little bit at your question, and but I want to hear it in your words and hear you kind of with more. But I think I'm feeling you. Yeah, no, I was just thinking about um, the difference between middle class, not necessarily upper middle class, but just like middle, middle class and working class and um, the differences between like what you grew up in your family of origin versus like if you're an adult now and what class you would consider yourself in. Um, it's always something that's confusing for me because I think that I grew up in what would be considered a middle class family. Um, but right now, I don't know if I would be considered middle class or working class. It's, it's one of those things where it's like, yes, I have, I have a good place to live and I have a job where I make decent, sorry, that's my son. No problem. Money, Hi, but kiddo. <laughs> welcome to the, welcome, happy to have you learn too. Can never start too early. Yeah. Um, but what, like, even though both my spouse and I work still typically end up living like paycheck to paycheck, you know, yeah. we don't make well above minimum wage. Yeah. Yeah. Where is that line between working class and middle class or has it changed because of our economy? 
Um, so I'm going to, my answer is one of, I don't know, right? I don't know if we think <laughs> about classifications, right? That the, the potentially there are classifications that we see that come from financial institutions, from the government, right? From how that those labels are uh, defined. I'll say, I don't know, but I would agree with you that there has been a change, right? There's been a change in the past few generations. We hear often, right, about the shrinking of the middle class because of how those lines are changing. Um, but you do really bring up an interesting and important context of how we see the world. Because we often, I, I, you know, I have a really good friend who um, works at a university. She's pretty, she's very successful. She lives a very comfortable life and she grew up in poverty. And those early lessons and the early socialization that she had of learning and how there was that scarcity piece and there was a lot of fear around money, that even though she's in a different class and status now, she is still very much driven by that early socialization and, and operates, her money story is still in a place of operating around fear and she's working to unlearn that. So it really, you know, a lot of this in how we see the world is how we are um, and how that comes. So I love your question. I, I, um, I imagine there might be folks on this call. Again, the wisdom of the room is greater. There might be folks on this call who have some um, input and might know a little bit about those distinctions. And when we look at, you know, where's the poverty line, where's working class, how does that distinguish from middle, middle, upper? And sometimes we hear even, um, I've been hearing owning class um, at the very top folks who are just you know accumulating so much. So if there is somebody on the call that has a little bit more information, up oh, there you go, bring oh, through something in right away, but love, love to bring your voices in. Can I, can I Thank just share a perspective, Malia, with you with what mm -hmm. I think um, I think it's also cultural that's really important because you know I was born and raised in uh, West Africa. So I was born in Accra in Ghana. So the thing about being raised in West Africa was um, from a perspective that I, I never knew we were poor. <laughs> I, I know that sounds funny, but you know, because what we, what we considered as well were not what you consider wealthy. So, and you know this, I'm serving in the Peace Corps. So it was about family and it was about, you know, um, our surroundings and, and the things we considered as wealth and not what you consider wealthy. So from an outsider's perspective coming in, you know, we were always clean and we were always healthy and we always went to school and we always had enough because, you know, we had each other and we had family and we always, you know, so, it, it was really interesting. It wasn't until I got older, looking back now, and even just kind of thinking about the amount of space we had and the fact that me and my two sisters, three of us as, you know, teenage girls shared one room. But I thought, oh, my God, the three of us shared, a, you know, that was not, you know, that wasn't a lot of space. And I think of it compared to what I have now that I thought, oh, yeah, we were kind of poor. You know, and I think about standing in food lines with my mom. My mom had, my mom made it so gracious and she made the, the poverty situation have such dignity and humility to it. I can't explain it that, you know what I mean? So I, I grew up thinking this is the best life ever, but it's the only life I knew. But my mom gave it such grace that for me, if you would ask me how'd you grow up, I'm like best childhood ever. I love that. I, for. I don't know. It just so it, it is literally perspective. But if we go by numbers and you know how many in your household based on this income, oh yeah, we were pretty we were pretty darn poor. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just it's it's kind of relative to culture, to area, and and what you perceive as well. And it changes regionally by country and yeah, you know, so. absolutely, absolutely. I'm so glad you said that because really I'm. Today, I'm ta we're talking in the context of dominant U.S. culture, but absolutely, when we move to, when we're in different parts of the world, there are different values. Some of them are the same, right? But there are different value systems. One I might think of is um, age, right? Where age lives on the spectrum of how different cultures honor and serve or don't um, folks as they age and their elders can be a another distinguishing factor, but there are many, right? That's the things are going to get messy, right? This is messy. It's hard, but it's not impossible, 
right? We can, we can certainly move through this. So I wanna share a couple of um, common trends or come, oh, oh, I'm still in annotate mode. Let me get out of there. Oh yeah, here we are. We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are, which is profound in so many ways because we go, oh yeah, that's true. And then when we start thinking about how do we be in community? How do we be in partnership with others? We need to try to, to recognize how we see the world as we are, but recognize that is not a universal view. Not everyone is seeing the world from, from where I stand, from what I can see and in this body and in these life experiences. So we wanna work on helping and connecting with others. So we do start to see things more as, as the situations are, as so we can see the systems, we can see what's at work. So some common patterns, I know I often think, um, when I first heard the word privilege, I thought of like Paris Hilton, I thought of Kim Kardashian, I thought, you know, to me, it really was centered around wealth. And there are folks who I know have often thought like, that's really not the right word for it, or couldn't there be a better word for it? There's so much confusion. What could it be? Hey, I, I don't disagree with you. And I also feel that the more time that we spend in our wordsmithing and trying to find that perfect word when, hey, there's no such thing as perfect. Um, but when we try to find that perfect word and we're stuck in debate, we're using all our energy and all our um, thoughts toward the word instead of using our energy and our thoughts toward shifting and change. So I wanna honor those folks who are like, I just don't like the word, I'm, it doesn't sit well with me. I wanna honor that for you, totally get it. And let's let's keep moving forward, right? Let's, let's settle for this uh, B minus 80% satisfaction with the word and kind of move in there if we have to. Um, but when we look at some of these patterns and maybe you have been, as I've been chatting, access, empowered to resources. So I had said how um, some of our identities are earned or unearned, our privileges earned or unearned. And I wanna talk a, a bit about education, right? So sometimes we earn our education but if I think about my experience, yes, it was something that I earned. I went, you know, I went on to college, but I also lived in a family where we had the financial means to that college would was certainly something we had to plan for and be intentional about, but it was an option. I grew up in a community where um, actually there were many, many, I'm from Southwestern Pennsylvania. There were many universities and colleges all like scattered around the area. So you, it was talked about a lot university life, going to college was talked about, it was reinforced. And most of the people in my community and the people, many people in my family attended college. And so it was, I think about how it wasn't, it was earned, but I had exceptional access. I had exceptional access. And when I think about privilege and as I shared earlier, like when the dominoes started to fall and I was seeing it everywhere and everywhere, um, I started to say, ooh, I've been told that I'm exceptional. I've been lifted up to this place of that, oh, what an exceptional great student, all of these things. And none of that might be true. It might be somewhat true, but it could be average. And what was exceptional was my access to opportunities. What was exceptional was the, uh, the, the ways that I was able to take hold of what was available to me. And so wanting to own that, of, I still worked hard, right? I still had to put in the effort and there were things available to me. So, which again, which I was unaware of. Um, I wanna to focus too here on, um, I've kind of talked a little bit about the word privilege. I also wanna talk about the word marginalization, also not a perfect word. Um, we hear oftentimes um, there's some nuance around that. I, I absolutely think that words matter, but sometimes you might hear subjugated, subordinated, at risk, um, disenfranchised, we've referenced othered. Um, all of those words will ping folks in different ways. Um, I don't know that we've landed, you know, as an industry, I don't know that we've landed on the, the, the right place. Um, you know, right is even questionable. But today I'm using marginalized because I want to think about that, that separation. Um, I am a big fan of and I follow the amazing team here in Arizona at Insight Consultants. Um, and their website is margins2center.com. And I love that. It's not about 
you have it or I have it, we have it. It's about, you know, how do we bring the margins into the center? And so how do we create space in the center so that there's room for us? And what times, you know, in our privilege, what time do we have to be like, I've been center for a long time. I might just want to kick back a little bit and deal with that. So for today, um, I'm using the word marginalized, but I want to recognize that it's not what you might always see. It might not be what you prefer. Um, but I wanted, I just wanted to kind of clarify that because I love their, I love their website name. I think it really paints an important picture. Um, here we are of oftentimes folks in privilege are given the benefit of the doubt or, um, and in our marginalization, when we challenge, um, that's there's there's punishment or there are consequences. We 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 learn pretty quickly where it's safe to speak up and where it's not, um, and where to push against it. I would say a litmus test for those of you um, in different privileged identities. If you think about your inventory or the wheel, a litmus test is sometimes wondering to to say is is there inequity here? Is if I if I were to push against this system, if I were to speak up and challenge this, is there a risk to me? Could I maybe be ostracized or could I be, you know, thought of saying like, oh, a troublemaker or could I be? And if the answer is yes, right? If the answer is yes, when you push against a system, um, there's probably inequality there. So using that as a gauge, I think is, is helpful. Um, we have come far, we have changed. We have done some good work and it's not yet enough, right? So that yes and, right? So looking at this, I realize it's, it's two columns, but really looking at our experiences of, of yes, we, we've made progress and yes, we have far to go. But oftentimes in our privileged identities, we're like, well, look at this, fantastic, right? A couple of years ago, 2014, right? Um, gay marriage was legalized nationally. Great, we're good. Well, you know what, there's still disproportionate rates of discrimination. We see, um, we're talking about intersections and compounding, we see that black trans women are, are experience violence more often disproportionately than, than others. So yeah, there's work to be had. It's never done. I wanna pause actually at this point and um, ask if there are any questions. And been talking for a while, so a little sip of water. We don't have any questions in our chat. Does anyone have a question? If you want to ask a question directly to Malia at this time, please raise your hand and we will try to bring you live. I want to. It looks um, like everyone wants to learn from you. <laughs> well, okay, well, that's one way to interpret it. Um, but thanks. Uh, yeah. I want to um, just spend a moment on um, the, the pattern here of expected to assimilate or the choice to assimilate following the rules go along to get along. Um, we saw it in just our right handed and left handed um, experiment, right? We saw people saying, I was forced to use my right hand. I was supposed to go with what, you know, the quote unquote norm. Um, I, I work with a woman who is, um, identifies as Latinx, and she talks about how uh, when she and her family were here, her parents um, really wanted to make sure she worked in this, like they came here, she wanted to have, they wanted to have a good life for her. So she needed to learn in a way, right, learn the rules, learn how to go along to get along, learn how to work in this system. And in doing so, that assimilation is lost. Right. And there are, if, if anyone's interested for the white folks on this call, if there's anyone interested to learn about the cultural loss um, of, among white folks um, in the, the migration to the U.S. and the founding of the U.S., I've got some resources for you that are really interesting because we all have loss in, in assimilation. Um, but I just want to kind of think about that, that piece of when go along to get along. Is that what we want? Is that... Um, is that fair? Is that necessary? And what do we what do we sacrifice of ourselves? And what are we asking our peers and our coworkers to sacrifice of their selves if we're operating in this go along to get along model? All right. So this is this is where I really I really would love to hear some voices. 
So the, um, if any of you are familiar with Dr. I imagine many of you are actually familiar with Dr. Beverly Tatum, who had written, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? A um, lot of great social, how are we socialized? Um, how do we learn who we are from ourselves? And how do we learn who we are based on how the world um, reflects to us? But she has likened um, privilege to, the, to a moving walkway. And I would love to hear, I would love for you to think about that for a little bit. So we've kind of set up some things about privilege, um, a little more context. It's not about numbers, right? It's not necessarily about majority. Um, sometimes it's innate, sometimes it's earned, unearned, chosen. Um, when you have it, you can't give it back even if you didn't ask for it. Um, but I would love to hear some thought around um, how might privilege be like a moving walkway? And I'd love if you wanna do some raise hands, this is where I'd love to hear some voices. I have a few examples, but always the group comes up with such phenomenal um, examples of, of how to apply this metaphor to the concept of privilege. Oh, I've never known this group to be this shy. I was going to you know, the, uh, the whole, the facilitator tactic of like, it's okay. We're okay with silence. <laughs> We're okay. All right. Someone will come. So April said something really great in the chat. Um, she said, mm -hmm. you move faster without trying harder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, how about, I'll pose some questions to folks. If you're on the moving walkway, do you have to move at all to get where you're going? Do you have to exert, potentially exert any energy to get where you're going? Oh, I like that. Your environment, yeah, it changes the time. Uh, right? There's always somebody, you know, this is where, this is walking lanes over here, standing lanes over here. Absolutely. Um, in privilege, you're moving with your privilege without noticing what others don't have, their barriers, their hardships. Mm -hmm. um, has anyone ever had a really tight connection or you got delayed somewhere and you've got your carry-on baggage and your connecting flight is not next door, right? It is a haul. You're going to have to work and you're going to have to get there. So you got your baggage, you've got everything, you're moving on the moving walkway, excuse me, pardon me, all right, excuse me, getting through, getting through, and you just make your plane. Um, how's that like? Can, Celine, um, Celine Shockensee, uh, I'd love to bring you live with us to kind of talk about what, um, what you've said here, if that's okay. So I'm gonna see if I can do that. Mm, yeah, I'm uh, seeing that too. That's, that's, that's a great bad. comment. And if you guys wouldn't mind, we'd love to see you as well this morning if you are up for it. Uh, so when you do come in, if you would turn your camera and audio on as well, that would be amazing. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Hi, Hi everyone. Christine. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Hi, Joanna. I wish Christine were here. I know. Oh, it's so good to see you. I, I miss you guys so much. I'm here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh. And I, yeah, after living in Tempe for nine years, so I'm so happy to have met Christine and to know Diversity Leadership Alliance because with the riots that we had, and it was more so a, a summer of domestic terrorism, we literally, it was worse than the news reported that some of the concepts that you all and Christine stand by really help me now and will help me into the future and to help me create sacred space wherever I am. So namaste and thank you. So namaste much. indeed. We're riding on her wings, just so you know. Those glorious wings are keeping us all up, just so you know. We don't do this. We don't do this work without her. So <laughs> glad you're here. Yes. So I was going to say with entitlement, and there are times when sometimes we assume that entitlement um, is, is strictly white, but it's not for me, you know, as a person that wears many heights, because I refer to myself as psychedelic, all-encompassing. For the Afri African-American <clears throat> hat that I wear, I was taught very early at a young age that your lighter skin, you're going to have some privileges that maybe my other darker skin counterparts or relatives wouldn't have, but I was taught to when you're in an environment and you see that and you take notice to then be the opener, to become the opener, because sometimes people, you'll be in an environment where people won't 
know or <clears throat> they haven't had privileges, you become the bridge and you open those doors for the people behind you. You become the first so that there are many behind you and to acknowledge that there is privilege. And it's, it's, it's how you use it. When you're aware of it, how are you using it? Are you gonna use it to build bridges, to help to break down walls and barriers? Or are you gonna use it strictly for yourself? Cause let's face it, it's out there, but I think it's how you use it. And if you're aware of it, sometimes it's a dangerous thing to be unaware that you have privileges that other people don't have. That's it. Right. Well, thank you so much, Celine, for joining us all the way from mm -hmm. Minneapolis, you said, right? Yes, thank you so much. And I'm going to take that time. We have people all over the country, but not also we have them all over the world. So a yeah. shout out to Hong Kong today. Thank Woo! you for joining us. Sorry, I had to do that. Um, okay. But uh, Malia, I'm going to toss it back over to you. Okay, great. Yeah. Celine, thank you so much. I, I love you. You teed, teed it up perfectly. Because my question for everyone is how do we how do we broaden our walkways? How do we make the walkways wider so that we fit on it? And that there were some other comments in here that I really liked. Um, let's see if I can find it. Da, 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 da. Um, it seems available to everyone. You just have to step on and go, right? You just can get on and go. It truly, like literally in the moving walkway experience, though, what if you're a mom and you're with a stroller? Um, what if you're somewhere there are it's seat, right? We see oh, it's, it's available. Why would anyone choose to walk? Um, I will, and, and sometimes we're not paying attention, right? We're paying attention to the people who are on the walkway, not the folks who chose that middle lane. Um, unless you're at the airport with my mother who likes to give you that look of like, you want to race, you want to race. And she tries to walk faster. So that's when I pay attention. But um, what we see and what we don't see, um, the amount of effort that is exerted, right? So somebody could be walking in the middle and by the time they get to their gate, pretty sweaty, just like you when you were late for your plane and got on the moving walkway and were sweaty, but that moving walkway gave you that edge, right? Gave you that edge. Um, but yeah, I love that. How do, we, how do we broaden the walkways? How do we create opportunities for folks to get on with us? I mean, that's kind of where I wanna take things um, as we go. I see some recommendations in the Q&A um, my grandmother's hands by um, it's Resma. Is it Resma Menak? I saw it was up there. Resma Menakin. I yeah, I just put it in the chat. Okay, great, super. I was gonna say I have the book somewhere, and if I try to find it, well, you'll see how insane nope. my there's, book. There's is. a link. There's a link in the chat for it for Amazon and uh, everything there for you. So thank you for that, Kathleen, for that recommendation. Yeah, absolutely. And I would I would say like Amazon if you want it tomorrow, but also. Don't forget, there are great, like if you look in um, local bookstores or you look for black owned bookstores, many bookstores are sending, right? And it might not be tomorrow, but we can support local. We can support those businesses that might be having a tough time during COVID and we're redistributing wealth, right? We're redistributing wealth into um, like those who are right in our communities. Um, instead of maybe a, tri a, a soon to be trillionaire, I heard. Um, but thinking about where and how we spend our money um, for those of us who are in a place of some class privilege um, and might have the ability to say like, you know, it's 50 cents cheaper through Amazon or it's a buck 50 cheaper through Amazon, but I really wanna support my locally owned organizations. I really wanna support minority black owned, um, female owned bookstores, things like that. So that's something I encourage you to, to try to do. Um, let's see. So we talked about like how, what are some of those insidious ways that our privilege and operating, if we show up in our privilege and we show up in that place of not being as aware of what's happening to our coworkers, our siblings, our friends, our community members who are um, who don't experience the same privilege. There are a lot of ways that we're able to deny. We're so, we're, that denial is, is a place where we often live. So I'm gonna talk a little bit of that before I get into really the model. And I, wanna, I want you to think about different times when maybe someone has come to you or maybe you have gone to someone else and, and practice loving accountability and saying like, you know, what you said or the way this is operating is really leaving some folks out. So, and sometimes, you know, I say loving accountability. Sometimes it is like straight up call out accountability. It might not feel very loving. It might not. 
but I will say, um, what I have, what I have learned is that if somebody is calling you out at all, it is because they want to preserve the relationship because they can't bear to continue. The relationship would be harmed if they don't say anything because the harm and the trauma to them is so significant. So they can't, so they have to say it. And if they didn't say it, they would just walk away from the relationship. Like eventually it'd be like, you know, I can't with you anymore. But if somebody, you know, regardless of if it's candy coated or, you know, coated in hot sauce, right? Whatever, then it is a, it is a gesture of, I believe that you can change. I believe that you can do better. I believe that you're not showing up in the way that I know your values to be. So if we kind of think about it that way, instead of those defensive, like, oh, shit, I really messed up. I did something wrong. I don't even know. Um, going, oh, you cared enough about me to show me where I'm screwing up. You know, kind of a shift in, in that possibility. But so, so I want us all to think about one of those moments. Think about a time when either you were the caller inner, caller outer, or you were the one on the receiving end. Here are some of the ways that we deny that privilege exists. Sometimes we might use uh, what my coach Kathy O'Bear has called PLEs, perfectly logical explanations. So it's like, oh, you know, somebody's been using, somebody's been making some universal conversations about Christmas, the upcoming Christmas holidays. They're only talking about Christmas. How aren't we all so excited to have days off at Christmas? And say, hey, you know, some people are probably very excited, but everyone might not universally hold Christmas as special or as relevant as you do. When we talked about that, you know, somebody said, oh, you know, she didn't mean anything by it. She's holding a lot of work right now and she's really stressed out. There's a lot going on with her. Well, I, 100%, totally, I totally believe that. And it's worth mentioning, right? So we have those perfectly logical explanations to dismiss things away. Um, or we've got a lot of yeah buts, um, which let's see, which one, there's an um, amazing consultant in the arts and theater world. Her name is Lisa Mount, and she calls them the, the Waskily, the Waskily Yabbits. <laughs> so if you're all a Looney Tunes fan at all, we can think back of those Waskily Wabbits. She says the Waskily Yabbits, because they come up all the time. Yeah, but they're a good person. Yeah, but I didn't mean that, right? Intention. Well, let's talk about intention. Let's not talk about the impact. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Um, or the, you know what, that happens to me too. That happens to my group. That's not just, that's not, not just happened to somebody who's black. I'm white and I've experienced that. Again, I believe that's true. And let's talk about frequency. Let's talk about impact. Let's talk about, is that if you've, uh, talked about microaggressions, right? Maybe you get a mosquito bite once and, and you're good. And other people are getting mosquito bites all over their body all the time, every damn day. So, so that, let's see, what are other ways that we, that we deny things? Um, the, oh, you know what? I, I know someone who's gay and they don't think the same way as you do. I, I have my friend and, and they don't, they disagree. Mm -hmm. I, I also believe that's true. And I believe that we have to remember that not, none, in none of our identities is their monolith, right? That complexity of our humanity. So say, yeah, that might be very true for your friend. And here's how I'm telling you I feel, and I need you to acknowledge it. Um, that doesn't happen to me, so therefore it doesn't exist, right? It doesn't happen to me. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. You're probably, you're probably in misinterpreting that. Um, or here's, here's one that I also think is important, the, the what about. So we have the yeah buts, but we also have the what abouts or the don't you think, you know? Racism is a significant problem in our country right now, but what about anti-Semitism? Don't you think that's important? I think that deserves some attention. A hundred percent, absolutely anti-Semitism needs to be discussed. But sometimes I talk about how sometimes we need to zoom in. Sometimes we need to say, can we just talk about race in this conversation? Can we just keep this centered? Especially something that is when we center it, it often gets pushed to the margins. Can we just keep this centered? And then when we have, when we finish this conversation that is uncomfortable and would rather be talking about this other thing, when we finish it, yeah, then let's talk about anti-Semitism. That's horrendous and that's awful. And we want to talk about that too. But it's kind of knowing when it's a, when it's an additive conversation or when it's a deflection. Like, you know what, this doesn't apply to me, but I, I felt this other thing. So we go there. 
Um, yeah, it's a dodge. And um, if anyone, this this is the one that I think gets gets us all riled up. You're being so sensitive. You're overly sensitive. You're too sensitive. Um, if we were, if we were on a whole gallery, I'd be like, let me let me see the hands. Let me see that everyone has been like the number of times I've heard that or I felt that. Um, the dismissal and the denial of our our feelings and our truths. Um, oh, I see. Um, we've got a hand, a couple hand raises. Is that a, yeah? I agree. Or or if you want to come on, double raise your hand. We can do that because I'd love to hear some voices. Um, talk about maybe experiences where um, I'd love to hear if you heard something in there that you do or that you have done in the past and go, oh shit, I just realized I've been denying privilege and therefore denying the the lived experience of someone else. Um, if you're brave and willing to share that, I mean, I, I was look this list. I've done every single one of them, every single one of them. I don't do well. I'm gonna say I'm trying to not do them now. I'm aspiring and always working at it, but I've done every one of these. So I wonder if there's somebody who's brave and who might be willing to bring their voice in and talk about a time that you're like, oh, I've been saying that and I just realized that it's problematic. I just realized that potentially the folks that I was talking with that I dismissed their experience. And if you don't want to come on, that's a great journaling prompt for today. When you have time and you want to say like, let me continue to process. Let me journal some of this about what are some of the ways that I think I've denied others experiences through my lens of privilege. So what do we, what do, we do? Why do I, this is, you know, oh, everything's going on. So we talk about privilege when it's unseen and it's unacknowledged, it undermines our efforts for equity and inclusion. It keeps us tripping up. And in the video, we saw all the, the, rock, the privileged rocks like kind of piling up into a pyramid. So what do we do? How do we start seeing it? How do we start acknowledging it so that we can advance equity and inclusion and justice? So here's, here's the model that I'm playing with. Um, I welcome, welcome, welcome anyone's feedback anytime. If it hits you like three days from now and you're like, I want some Malia message because that thing didn't sit right with me. And I think maybe so I welcome feedback because this is a, a model in development, in practice. Everything is always evolving. Um, but I'm using the word embrace. And I don't necessarily mean to embrace our privilege because we could embrace our privilege and be like, I'm good. Thanks, y'all. You know, we're good. I want to say let's, let's embrace this reality. Let's embrace that this is true and that privilege exists. And if we do that, we can work through it. So when we embrace... And we've done a little bit of this. We've kind of given you a teaser. Examine your identity to understand where and how you hold your privilege. So that worksheet is one tool for that. Um, there are others online. If you look at kind of social identity wheels, there are some great things where you can start to say, hmm, where do I land on this? Um, while, while this model will come up looking like it's a step-by-step -step and it's linear, I will say it could be, might not be. It might go in many different orders. Or you might be at a space where you're like, whoop, something popped me back to the beginning. I got to do some more examining. I got, actually, I got to more than examine. I need to excavate. I need to get some stuff out of the way to really understand the socialization, the culture that I've had and how I hold privilege. And manage your emotions when you do that, right? How do we manage our emotions? We might feel confused. We might feel resistance, you know, still some of that denial. I don't think so. And we might feel guilt. Um, I saw somebody um, using the word, you know, there's also some shame that comes into it. Um, Francesca says that's not productive. Um, I, I say when we feel guilt or when we feel shame, it's an indicator, right? It's the check engine light. Something is off. Something is off from my values. Something's showing up and I'm stirred. And so it's an indicator. It's not a place to stay, right? It's not a place to, when your check engine light comes on, what do you do? You go to the mechanic and say, what do we do? How, do? how do we get through this? What needs to be fixed? What might need to just be tightened or adjusted? It might not be massive. Um, so thinking about that and using that, like, let me manage my emotions. Let me remember that discomfort is okay. Discomfort or being uncomfortable is different from being unsafe. 
Um, so being able to recognize that and then staying in it. So with that, we're gonna build resilience because when we can manage our emotions, we can stay in it. We can take that deep breath of, oh damn, I just got called out. I'm in this moment um, physically, right? My stomach's in knots. All I wanna do is run for the door, flight, fright, flight, flight, fight, freeze, fawn, flounder, right? There are other F words you might be thinking of at that point, um, but we want to stay in the moment. So we want to have that resilience. We want to breathe and have our mindfulness because that is where when we get past the discomfort and past the fear, learning and growth is on the other side of it. And man, learning and growth, like that's the place to be. That's where then what we're feeling in our bodies is like tingly and good and awesome, right? Get rid of that yucky feeling. Let's get into learning and growth. All right. And root, and for their art, root into a practice of accountability for yourself and for others, right? It might be inviting and, and building some of the relationships where you have, where you ask people to say, you know, I want you to, will you hold me accountable? You know, I'm, I'm working on this. I know there are things I still don't see. I say this all the time to my colleagues. I know there are things I don't see. I know I'm still showing up in harmful ways in my whiteness that I don't even know yet. Please, please be that mirror for me. Um, but also you don't want to put that only and be like, Hey, um, you know, I'll say my, my friend Jasmine, she and I work together a lot. I don't expect her to be my accountability partner. I'm not going to put it just on her, a black woman to tell me when I'm doing my whiteness, right? It's not her responsibility in our relationship that we've built, which is strong. We are thought partners. So there are times for that, but I also need to do it on my own. I need to go to white spaces and have and be talking with white folks who are deep in this work and saying, here's where I screwed up. Here's some things. There's some really great white accountability spaces. I know I'm centering race in this moment. Um, that's really where I am in my head and my thinking um, for the past several months. Um, but what does accountability look like for you? Maybe it's setting a learning path. Maybe it's like, you know what? I'm gonna do a little DIY learning. I'm gonna get online and find some materials. I'm gonna read an article and I'm gonna pay attention to in those articles where I have to listen harder when I initially disagree at first. And what's that mean? Am I doing confirm, uh, confirmation bias and finding a way to disagree? Or do I need to engage in conversation with others? What does accountability look like for you? And then also when we hear our loved ones, our neighbors committing microaggressions, upholding systems, how are we gonna start to say, hey, I see some, I didn't see it before, but I see it now. I think you need to see it too. I, that loving accountability of you're not showing up in your values. You are someone who I know to, to love others and be open and want to see this world change. But what you just did is not moving that needle forward. Let's talk about that. A, aligning your impact with your intentions. Truly what I just said, you know, my, my white savior complex aha moment really was when I had some people come to me and say, you're here to fix us, right? Screw you. We don't need that. We don't need your help. And I was in a place, my mental space um, growing up and at that time was, um, I, it was my responsibility to help. And it was the, the phrasing would be those less fortunate, those people, those, and it's like, hmm, what if I actually start looking and saying like, what are the conditions that create fortune and less fortune? And not going in to say, I need to hold this responsibility and I'm gonna save and fix, cause that's gross. Like I was, for me, when I look at myself in those times, I think that's some of the cringeworthy stuff. How do I get into community? How do I say, what do we all learn from each other? And it was when I realized that my desire and my values and my intention to do good in the world was not what I was doing. I was just perpetuating systems that my impact was over here in this crappy, awful place. But my intentions were like, hey, I'm, you know, here we are intention. We wanna align them. We wanna bring it so we're working in our values. We're standing in our intentions and people are seeing the intention and feeling that instead of feeling harm, instead of feeling othered, instead of feeling dismissed, instead of feeling talked over again, right? So aligning. Here's cause like, I just, 
I'm a Libra. I could not commit to one C, so I had to make it a C squared. Um, but here we commit to new behaviors, right? So we realize, oh, these things that I've been doing are, don't show up the way I want to. How else could I show up? What are some alternatives? What are some new habits, some new practices that I can bring so that when I'm collaborating with others, when I'm collaborating across and among difference, I'm more effective. I know where and when I can be of value and be useful and where other voices are valuable and useful and I can lean back. I see it looks like we brought someone in. Do we have a question or a comment or something to share? Maybe, maybe not. No, maybe she's still, I think she's still there, but we do, we do have a couple of questions going on, but I didn't want to interrupt you with your, with your, yeah, let, me, let me hit, let me hit our final E, yeah, so finish we don't your keep e. everyone in suspense, right, what's that last E, we need it, um, and then we'll do questions, absolutely, um, so our last E is elevate the voices, the efforts, and the organizations that are closest to the problems and the issues that we want to see change, that we want to, where we want to see resolution, if I think about it, I know there's been kind of like a, it's a concentric circle activity. So if the, the concentric circle and at the very center is the issue, the issue is um, food insecurity. Okay, I'm not in that first circle. I've not, I'm, I'm not experiencing food insecurity at this point in my life. I'm not in that next circle where I think there are people in my life who are experiencing food insecurity. I'm probably a couple more circles out saying, I know there are some organizations who are dealing with this. I don't see this in my daily life. So if I'm this far away from the problem, how could I possibly think? And I did. I used to think I had the answers. But now I say, how could I think I have solutions when I'm not even up close and personal with this issue? But there are people who are. There are voices who are. There are efforts that are working to change this. There are professionals and grassroots organizers who are doing amazing things because they are right at the center of the issue. So I'm gonna elevate their voices. I'm gonna listen to them and I'm gonna follow their lead, especially when I'm coming from a place where I'm not even close. I'm gonna follow their lead. The answers are in the people, right? That's the beauty of this in everything that we do. The answers are in the people. If we create the opportunities and the conditions for the answers to rise up, Rise up, rise up. Anyone a Hamilton fan? I only saw it recently and, and I loved it, but I'll tell you what, I am so irritated because I cannot get the music out of my head. I can't, I keep trying. So this is, yes, this is totally a place where we can stop and have some Q&A. Um, I'd love to hear some, uh, some thoughts about the model or if you can say like, oh, here's something that I do. Here's one of my accountability practices. I'd love to hear your examples because I think a lot of us are doing some of this work um, and again, you might, when you get into that C squared and you're collaborating effectively with others and somebody says like, Hey, you did that again, right? You did that thing. It might throw you right back up into M, right? This is not necessarily a check it off and we're done. Whew, I'm finished. It's perpetual cycle. So. Okay. So if you want to answer and comment on the question that Malia just asked, please raise your hand. But before we get there, we have a, a, a couple of questions and then, uh, Mariana de la Fuente, we're going to bring you live shortly. But first, um, Anne Riley uh, does not have a microphone, so she asks that I ask this question for you. And she says that she um, tends to compare uh, that her marginalized history as a white woman in a man's workplace to white privilege. She says that she's white, but I want to empathize with others by comparing it to gender privilege. Is she then discounting white privilege? She wants to know, like, to, she, I, and then she wants to show that she understands how it feels. So yeah. can you talk about that a little bit? And then we have one other quick question before we go to Mariana. Absolutely, sure. Um, Anne, thank you. Great question. Um, I, I, I feel you. I feel you in that place. I think, you know, I had this conversation with, uh, with a colleague recently around when, when to be aware right, of, of what's, what's, the, what's the context, right? What's the issue on the table? And if the table is rooted in a conversation around race, um, and we can relate, like white women, we can relate to oppression, we can relate to systemic marginalization. Um, and maybe it's, I can relate in, but it's how do we not make that then about the white woman's experience? How do we make sure that we're not, um, sucking the air out of the room 
Um, I will say as something that I have been known to do and unfortunately do very well, but sucking the air out of the room and making it about the Malia show and my story and my pain, but saying, holding empathy and saying, you know, if I, if I think about that, I have some understanding. I have a, I have a sliver of understanding, but not entirely. And there will be other contexts, right? Where you need folks to be talking about gender. And then we look at, there's the, I think the intersectionality even came from the case from, we've got any folks from Detroit, Michigan, a G General Motors, I think a case of race and gender bias that was brought forth by the black women. And this was in the seventies, right? Black women and GM said, we don't have a problem with race. Look at all of the black men that we have working in our factories. We also don't have a problem with gender because look at all of the white women in our administrative and secretarial staff. And they were like, no, nah, no, 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 right? No, there's the intersection here that is a problem. And so I think it's, and it's, you know, it's a dance, right? Sometimes we step in and sometimes we step out and sometimes we two step, right? But figuring that out, I think the lens of empathy is excellent. And also knowing when we've crossed the line from empathy to, to shifting the, the topic at hand and the issue at hand and we've taken and diluted it, right? Sometimes we, sometimes looking at all of it is important, but sometimes we don't want to dilute. I hope that, I hope that was an answer. And Joanna or Brent, uh, if you've got feedback as well on that question, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts as well. No, I think that's great. And, and thank you so much for, uh, for, um, for answering it that way. And I think, Anne, you have to realize that it's okay because sometimes I'll tell you what's really funny is that you have to, to use context. I'll give you an example. I've used this example for many of you that know. Um, I'll use the example of my children, right? I, I try to explain privilege to my children. Now I try to explain privilege to a 13 year old boy. It's very difficult. And at this time I tried to explain to him when he was about seven or eight. And I'm like, this is not going to go well. And when I took it out of my head and, and tried to bring it to his level, this is how it happened. We were on a summer day in the park. They were running around sweaty little boys, right? My sons all took their shirt off. I have two boys, right? And so they're running around woohoo, through the sprinklers at summertime. And my seven-year-old stops right in front of me. And Malia, he goes, mom, it's hot as all get out out here. You take your shirt off too. You'll be so much more comfortable. And I went, right, can't do that. <laughs> and he's like, we're at the park. It's like 110 degrees, mom, it's okay. You'll be so much more comfortable if you just take your shirt off. I said, mommy can't take her shirt off. Mommy's a girl. Mm -hmm. And he's like, that's weird, it's hot. And I said, right, it is. Totally yeah. agree with you, right there with you. It is hot, I'm still a girl. And I said, if mommy takes her shirt off right now, it is hot and mommy has nothing on underneath but her undergarments, um, it's going to be really embarrassing and people are going to look at mommy really weird. But AJ and I, my older son, took our shirts off and no one's looking at us weird. I said, right, you are boys. That is called male privilege and it's something you have that I don't have. And he was like, well, that's stupid. Again, he's a little kid, but he never forgot it. And for him, it was the first time, right, that he realized there's something different, and I'll use it as that, between mommy and I. I didn't ask for it. Mommy didn't ask for it. I didn't say, give me this thing, you know, and mommy said, don't give me this thing. But it's, it was so clear, and it was so crystal clear. He never forgot it. I could not have designed in all the ways that I was, you know, because we're practitioners, we think of all the lessons we're going to create. So, you know, using that, you know, the, the whole idea of, um, of gender might be a way that someone like gets it. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and so oftentimes when we try to kind of use our language and our lens, they might not get it. You know what I mean? It might not like click. And sometimes you have to use someone's kind of lexicon, their language, the thing that they know that they can relate. My son is 13. He never forgets it. For him, he can recognize it almost instantly now yeah. at 13, because at seven, he remembers that instance when mommy was running through the park with them and I was hot. I was like, I wish I could. But, you know, mommy might get arrested in this park. Like that wouldn't go so well. 
And mm -hmm. it was it was very clear to him that it was that distinction, you know, that separated us. And so, you know, when you're when you're trying to think about ways again to demonstrate this privilege, again, that we all talk about that you're not, you didn't earn it, right? None of us are, are you know, we didn't go through this thing to go check. I got this thing I just earned. You, you didn't earn it. It was just given. So now that you've given it, what do you do with it? That's mm -hmm. the whole thing about this idea of privilege. I always tell people, you didn't earn it. You weren't given it. But here's the thing with things that are, you know, that you have. What do you do with it? Now is your chance to, to harness it, just like you would harness anything else in your life. And you get a chance to now move it like you would anything else in your life for good or bad. Right, because I know some people that have privilege that have used it in very negative ways, and you know, and that's the thing about it is you get to choose how you use it. So, absolutely, I love that story. I love that story. <laughs> I was so like, oh, no, that that's not going to go very well. So, <laughs> and it brings in that that thing too of of proximity and proximate, right? So here's somebody who who loved you and cared about you and thought you're uncomfortable and wanted to create that same comfort that they were experiencing and saying, like. Oh, you don't, you deserve that comfort too. So thinking about how we talk about undeserved or unearned privilege, the marginalization is also undeserved and unearned. And the stories in our, you know, the narratives in our culture are about if they just would have, if they just worked harder, right? Pull ups by the bootstraps. It's like, no, 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 this is not deserved. It's the system. So. Thank you for that. And I know we've got some more questions coming in. We do. And uh, Mariana, I'm going to ask you to uh, unmute to ask your question really quickly. Uh, you're all set. There we go. And too, if you'd like, we'd love to see your beautiful face. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me see. Hold on one second. I tried to, to do it, but it doesn't let me. Doesn't want to work today. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't let me. The video doesn't oh, let me. Okay. <laughs> so hello everybody. I know everybody. I've been coming to DLA for a long time. Uh, so my question was um, that in personal conversations, perhaps we can address this issue with the other person. Perhaps is I like the examples that Melia was mentioned about minimization of the uh, the privilege. And so in a personal conversation, perhaps we can, we can engage with the other person, but in a professional level, when the intention is not a, a, to hurt the other person, when the intention is just uh, pretty much denial and they, they are not measuring their impact, like you said here in your letter A, they are not aligning with the impact. And I think many times it happens I'm, I'm referring to the one that they don't notice and they are not ready to face it. So maybe if we can chat a little bit about that work we can do at work. What is it, some strategies that we can utilize at work? We know um, at work that if it's something that is uh, in violation of policy, we go to our human resources. But I'm talking about the, the chat, the conversation, the day-to-day the -day conversations. Right that underlying stuff that you couldn't point to in a policy. It couldn't necessarily be proven, right, in a way, but, but it's still problematic. Um, oh, that's a great question. And it's, you know, right, the added complication is if we think of another intersection at work is our hierarchy, right? What is leadership doing? What is leadership withholding? How is leadership modeling change or not, right? Maybe leadership is holding firm and tight to tradition. Um, and then, you know, what is our, um, what is our own kind of social capital in the organization of, can I speak up? Even if it, even if it might be a risk, can I speak up and talk about this? Or is the risk too great? So I think of sometimes in, in work, it's finding, and sometimes, sometimes it's, it's not there, but if there are allies, Right? If they're allies in work or if there was a group of folks who were talking about this and being like, I noticed that too. Oh, yeah, I noticed that too. It might be who among that group is in a position of less risk to push against the system? Who could say like, you know what? I have a good relationship. I I've been with the organization a little bit longer. I, I, think I, I think this person will hear me 
differently than they might hear you or someone else. But so that's really in one of those ways where we think about how do we assess our privilege and use that as a, as a way to understand risk um, and a way to understand, is this safe for, for myself or for others? Um, I also think there's a conversation in workplaces that's really around um, what's, the, what's the organizational culture? What are the organizational values and how are we driving toward those? And how do we name when there are behaviors or practices that are, again, that are inconsistent with our values saying, you know, oh, we have a, uh, I'm trying to think of an organization that I worked for. We have a value of integrity. Okay, well, some of these things that we're doing don't speak to integrity. Should we, can we talk about that? Um, I would say sometimes it might just be unnoticing. I'm noticing this pattern, right? So maybe it's not, you know, coming out of like this, ah, we gotta fix this, but I'm noticing this pattern. Does anyone else notice this? Should we look at this? Is this pattern healthy for our organization? Um, I think that, and then tying the conversation to the mission, right? If you're a nonprofit, that mission statement is bold and strong. If you work for an organization or a corporation, you know, the, the mission to serve your community and also have a profit, right? We make more profit when our people are happy and respected and feel they belong. We, would, we do our best work. We contribute our most creative things when we're in a culture and a climate where we feel honored, seen, acknowledged, valued, right? So I think some of those conversations can be supportive. Um, Mariana, there's also, uh, I can share the link afterward, but I also think you would find it easily. There is a, um, it's on Medium, and there is a, a, was kind of like the business case for diversity. And the author of this, she's based in the Seattle area, and her voice in this article is like, how many times do we have to talk about this business case, right, before folks are going to get it? But she's got a whole compilation of some research and some studies around kind of profit, um, creativity, um, productivity that's connected to that. Um, so she's like, don't do the work yourself. I've got this whole compilation here. Let's get to the work. And again, it's that I find it frustrating when there's leadership who keeps saying, give me the business case, but it's like, it is out there, right? Let's take that energy that I would spend coming up with the research and working to convince, let's spend that energy to test some things out, to try something new. Um, and certainly like, there, is a, there is a relationship and a trust factor um, that always ties into this. Um, so I think truly it's, if you have a colleague and the relationship is strong enough, or it's one that you're willing to say, I want to preserve this relationship. Um, and maybe even if, you know, I, 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 I'm going to tread lightly here because this is something I can say from privilege. Like sometimes I do deliver candy coated um, call-ins. And I do, I spend a lot of time doing some mental gymnastics about how can I approach this person in a way that it's going to be effective, that's not going to send them running, that's not, um, and, and there's also an internal part of me that's like, wow, that's really centering their privilege. That's really con keeping me concerned about their comfort and their experience over the comfort of my colleagues who are continuing to feel um, alienated, continuing to feel um, exploited, continue to feel undervalued and, and not centering their comfort by just saying what I got to say. Um, but we're not there yet. Um, my goal, and I always hope that organizations could get to a place where they're normalizing um, educational call-in moments, right? Something happens in a meeting, someone says something, we're like, you know what, actually, let's pause just for a moment. You know, we don't use that language anymore. Here, here's the alternative. Here's what we're using now great, let's move on. And when that's normalized, it's just part of the flow. And somebody goes, oh, that's, you know, yeah. Yep, thanks, got it, needed to catch that. When it's not normalized, it's the, oh, spotlight's on me. I totally screwed up. Oh, I'm so embarrassed and how dare, I don't like the way they told me about that. I don't know, it goes in that defensive mode. But if it's normalized as part of a organizational culture, then the learn, you're in that learning and growing space versus that fear space. Joanna, other thoughts? I don't, and I, I think I'm going to actually that. jump in here, Malia. We're, we're at, we have about 10 minutes left of our time together with everybody. And we have a few more questions. So, oh, um, 
do you want to do like just do questions? We'll just finish up with some questions here. Is that okay? We've got about three more. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so go for it, Brent. See if we can get through the questions. So one of them is, you know, just sharing a couple of white accountability spaces that you talked about really quickly. Um, yes. So I, I, you know, it's been a while. I, I don't know if they are still doing it actively, but I know that locally in Arizona, um, Insight consultants were collaborating with Mass Liberation Arizona and uh, Thursday mornings. And again, I don't know if it's continuing. I know they did it a lot through the summer and it was every Thursday morning they would have a one hour conversation and it was for, for white folks to come in and get some learning, right? Let's talk about how do we follow um, our brothers and sisters of color? Like how do we follow our siblings, I should say, siblings um, of color? So that's one that I know occurs. Um, the coach that I had worked with and went through a Center for Transformation and Change, that is Dr. Kathy O'Bear. She is probably launching another white accountability space again. I know she, she and worked with a woman named Rachel Forrester, who I believe is at University of North Carolina, or I'll just say a university in North Carolina, but the two of them collaborate. Um, those are, those are two that I know of offhand, just kind of quick things, um, for folks who might be based in the, um, Southern California area, there's an organization called AWARE LA, and that's, that's like Association of White Anti-Racists Everywhere. Um, oh, you know, locally, and again, in Phoenix, there's a group called White Paws, and it's P-A-W-S, White People Against White Supremacy. So there are some groups where people, so some of them are like active groups. Some of them are discussion groups of like, okay, here's a space where we can kind of get our secrets out. We're, we're as sick as our secrets. Here's this thing I did. I'm feeling shame around this. Get it out and go like, yeah, I understand that. And here's what, here's how we hold ourselves accountable. Here's how we dig in and understand all of that unconscious bias, all of that socialization. Um, I, I'm, I'm continually um, moved and learned by Kathy O'Bear. Again, she is my, one of my primary coaches and mentors. Um, if I find some others, I will share those with uh, Brent and Joanna as well. I know um, if there's any folks in the New York area, um, there's a group doing, and I think there's one in Connecticut and they are CWC, which I believe stands for Constructive White Conversations. Um, so they're, they're kind of, they pop up. I don't think that there's necessarily like a, here's where to find one through a rock and you'll find one. But if you do a little of hunting, I think that you'll find some spaces in that you can connect to. Obviously now we're doing it all virtually and find the space that feels right. One, I was in one where the woman said, I came to this, I really wanted to be here. And I didn't realize just how very accountable y'all were going to hold me. <laughs> Yeah, when she said that, I felt it too. I was like, oh, we're, we really got to show up here. Well, this is not a space where we're going to be, you know, comforted and all oh, that's okay. I'm sorry you had that experience. I am sorry. And we got to work through it. So. so yeah, a couple of people have asked like for those, for those. So um, we will do our best uh, before we send out our survey. Um, we'll get those uh, from Malia so that we can, uh, the insights and the white paws and, and a couple of the other ones we'll send out to you. We'll do the best that we can on those. Okay, everybody. Um, we do have, um, so we have two really great questions that are gonna take more than six minutes to answer. Um, Go for it. Everyone, which, so, so, so everyone will just say, you know, we're gonna continue the recording. If you have to go, um, you know, we're okay. We're gonna stay around probably a little later, but if you have to go, we understand. And please look for the recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, soon. Uh, usually takes about a week for that to happen. But Lydia was talking about how to address microaggressions between coworkers or between a supervisor and a, a staff from an HR perspective. Um, an example is someone touching a black woman's hair and questioning the texture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's not, that's not a five minute answer right there. Um, great question, great question, Lydia. Thank you for asking it. Thank you for having this on your mind of how do we do this? So um, a f about, just about a week or so ago, and it might be recorded. If it, if it was recorded, I'm gonna find the link um, and share it with Brent and Joanna, was a workshop that I had did around responding to microaggressions. What are some 
um, skills, skills to respond, respond in those moments, right? Um, that are a, a variety of, of ways to engage in effective conversation, right? And we, so, so it's, you know, some, I've kind of mentioned the noticing, I'm noticing some patterns here. I'm noticing patterns of people saying these things. Do we, do we understand those are microaggressions? Do we, do we know what we mean when we say microaggressions? Do we know, it doesn't mean like, oh, it's that small thing that somebody got all worked up about. We mean, no, it's, it's an harm that is happening at the micro level, at the interpersonal level. Um, so I think sometimes understanding that definition is a place to start. Um, and then, yeah, noticing, you know, sometimes asking questions. Um, you know, what do you, could you say a little bit more about that? What do you mean about that? Um, interrupting, right? If there's something problematic, it's like, whoa, whoa, we're gonna pause that right there. We're not going there right now. I'll address it, with, you know, we'll address it, but right now we're gonna stay on this topic, but we gotta shut that down. Um, relating, you know, you know, here's a, you know, I've, I remember when that was how I felt and I felt pretty strongly about it until, the, you know, I had this shift in my awareness, this shift in my learning. So, I, you know, I can relate to you. I've been in those shoes. Um, or sharing personally, like, you know what, I, I think we need to talk about how, you know, can we talk about how this hurts? This is hurting me. This is hurting some of our colleagues. Um, we know it, it, it might not, we trust it's not intentional, but it still hurts. Right? If you think about stepping on someone's toe, you stepped on it, the, the, ow, you stepped on my toe. I didn't mean to, right? Well, it still hurts, right? Whether you meant to or not, my toe is throbbing, right? So, okay. Instead be that, you know, that the response being, oh, I'm going to pay attention to this differently. I'm going to watch where I'm stepping. I'm sorry. I own it. I totally did that. I wasn't paying attention. I was probably in my privilege, right? Just barreling all through. And I didn't even see your toe there. I'm sorry. I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to do better, right? So, so different ways to work through that. But yeah, if I can, it was, it was, I will say that was with YWCA Phoenix. Um, so it might be, um, on their Facebook page. I saw somebody, uh, so there's a Facebook, Facebook group called Get Real, white folks, white folks talking about race. And that reminded me, thank you, Amy. It, uh, there's a Facebook group called uh, Shared Sisterhood. And it is, uh, it is a multiracial space where their concepts are uh, dig and bridge. Right? We dig and do our own learning, we, we recognize, and then we bridge. And it's a really amazing space. And within that space, there are multiple um, racial affinity groups that'll have, say like, hey, I'm gonna have a, you know, somebody's gonna host a, a group for white women to come and talk at this. So sometimes within spaces, folks are doing some of that affinity accountability work. Um, so it's really funny you talked about trust because that is our final question. I think a great one maybe for us to end on in terms of how do you fix the trust? And I know you kind of talked about it a little bit by saying, first of all, of course, acknowledging and saying, I'm sorry, but what else can we do in order to fix tr that trust factor after it's been broken? <sighs> you know, I'm gonna, there is a TED talk that I have found to be pretty impactful about repairing and building trust. It is France, it's either Frey or Fry, I believe it's F-R-E-I, Francis Fry. Um, and it is, I believe, it might even be called um, building or rebuilding trust. And she talks about three pillars, um, logic, empathy, and authenticity, right? And how practicing logic, empathy, and um, authenticity is part of that rebuilding, but it's a, and it's not, it's a maybe like 13 ish minutes if you've got the time, but that's a phenomenal resource I would suggest. Um, let's see, we, oh, if anyone wants to grab a screenshot of this, I threw some, oh, a screenshot won't give you those as live links. I will send this slide out so it can be shared so you can have those as live links for some of those resources. Um, and, Here's where I think about, um, I want to kind of draw this back to trust and we also need to trust ourselves, right? When we learn and we recognize there are so many things we need to unlearn, all of a sudden it's like, I, I, I might go silent. I shouldn't even say anything anymore. I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't trust myself to not unintentionally harm someone. Um, life is complicated, right? We're gonna, that, that messiness. Um, but trust yourself that you are learning, 
right? And that you, if you are committed to this learning journey, I love this meme. It came to me a couple years ago and I just keep coming back to it from a uh, Instagram page at indigenous goddess gang. Some very inspiring stuff. If you need more joy after this call, go to that, that page and you, your tank will be fueled. But repeat after me, I'm allowed to be both a work in progress and help others grow at the same time. I refuse to wait until I believe I'm perfect or someone else has deemed me worthy of impacting others. I am unapologetically accepting a life of massive growth and improvement. Yeah. <sighs> Thank Beautiful. you all for letting me talk and share some of the stuff that has come from amazing scholars and mentors and, and multiple voices. I'm, I'm purely a conduit and it is an honor for me to do that. Bravo, bravo Malia, thank you so much. I am honored, uh, my, not just by you and your energy and your presence, but by being so open and authentic. And I think that that is what our audience relates to. That's why people come back to DLA uh, because I think that to do this work is to be vulnerable. To do this work is to be a constant student and to do this work is to be a steward. And you were all of those things this morning and I am so grateful for your time and your energy and your presence and, and for doing something that is so dear to me, which is honoring the land that we all sit on uh, this morning. That was so wonderful. And I think we forget that sometimes that, you know, we are on land that were cultivated by, you know, indigenous people way before we called it home and we got the, you know, pleasure of being able to enjoy this land and this space. So thank you. I am grateful for you. Uh, so thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, and Malia, welcome to the DLA family. Because if you know anything about us, you all know this. Once, once you join DLA, I, I jokingly call us, you know, a very loving cult. So when you when you do join us, you become part of, you know, <laughs> this, this I'm all place. in. I'm all in. <laughs> thank you so much. Talk about this is a place where you all certainly work hard to foster belonging and I feel it and I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. You are welcome. Well, thank you all for joining us for another DLA conversation, uh, Uncomfortable Conversations That Ignite Change. We're always glad to have you all here. We are grateful for your time. We don't take it for granted. We know that you have so many things to do and we're always grateful when you carve out some time to spend with us uh, to learn about equity, inclusion, and belonging. We do have a couple, um, another dialogue come in. One more. So our last dialogue of the year. And Brent, are you sharing or am I sharing? Uh, um, you're sharing. And while you do that, I'll stall yes. for you and let everybody know, please go to YouTube, search for Diversity Leadership Alliance, and that's where you will find all of our videos. Um, we don't send out the links or anything like that. They're live there. You can also check out our website, diversityleadershipalliance.org, where we do have links to all of those videos as well. I know a lot of you have been asking about, I want this link, I want this chat, I want this quote. Remember, a lot of this will be replayed for you, so you can see it there, but we will do our best, and Malia will do our best, her best to get us information so that when Joanna sends out the survey in the next day or so, we'll try to include some of those pieces for you. But you will always have this recording up for you on YouTube, which will take about a week. So please bear with us with all of that, okay? Thank you. Yes, you'll get a chance. And that's the one thing we're trying to be really good about. So if you've missed something, you're like, ooh, what did she say there? you'll get a chance to go back and watch this again and take some notes and uh, see the recordings. We're making everything available on our website and our YouTube page. Uh, and just so you know, because of our amazing uh, board of directors who really kind of guide the overarching vision and mission of our organization is how we do what we do. So I just wanted to, to get a chance to honor them. You know, oftentimes they're behind the scenes and we don't get a chance to honor all of them. Uh, so I wanted for you to see them and, and then just, you know, they're wonderful faces and all of the organizations that they represent 
from, you know, Perkins Coie Law Firm to SRP to Wells Fargo to Mayo Clinic to Valley of the Sun United Way uh, to the City of Phoenix uh, to Ability 316 University of Arizona. So we are really, I mean, we are supported by such an amazing group of board uh, members and, and I just do not even know how we would get it done without them. Of course, our amazing co-founder, uh, Mr. Marion Kelly that you see here and of course, Christine French our other co-founder who passed away uh, last year, uh, who is always with us. Uh, and then I would be remiss if I didn't also thank our amazing DLA Education Committee. Some of them are on the call today. Uh, if you have never had a chance to meet them, you're missing out some really wonderful people. And uh, of course, our driving force today, Dr. Brent Scholar, who produces all of our webinars. I don't know if you guys know this, yes. That's right. Thank, yeah, thank you. you it, it takes a lot of work to really, I know it looks like, oh, we just kind of pop on here, but you know, we, we rehearse this, we time it, we make sure everything runs, you know, with ease. And so there's a lot of back end work that goes into producing this. So Brent, I do not take what you do for granted. Thank you so much for the production of this. And thank you to our education committee led by Dr. Mallory Titel, uh, including Betty Thompson and Alethea Sessions, Shannon Walker, Kristen Walker that you see there and uh, Tyree Baze, Jackie Starks and Tondra Richardson. And there are quite a few others uh, but they are really the ones that design kind of the content piece that you see, including the uncomfortable conversations piece. So it's always good to put a face, you know, to a name. And so I just thought I'm sure they're beautiful faces today. So you see me sitting here, but beside me are all of these amazing people that really drive this agenda forward. So I thought it's always important for me to share uh, with them. So our last um, conversation, our last uncomfortable conversation will happen on December 10th. And it's the culmination of all of the conversations uh, into this last one. So dialogue number five is on anti-racism. And we're really going to talk about this idea of having conscious radical equity, right? Can we move closer to this idea of anti-racism? So this workshop is really going to be that blueprint for how to make conscious efforts and take intentional actions right, towards justice. So this is the one where you're gonna make some conscious choices about how do I take steps towards small ways. It can even be personal ways. How do I do it in larger groups? How do I attack a system, right? But this is all about really looking at systems and uh, things that are designed to oppress marginalized groups, oppress, you know, thoughts. Uh, but really we want you guys to kind of dive into this idea of what it means to be an anti-racist. Just to, you know, so to say, uh, I'm not racist, right? That's all good and fine. But do you know what it means to be an anti-racist? Those are two slightly different things. So we invite you to start this journey uh, where you move towards anti-racism. That will be guided by Timothy Overton, who's a commercial litigator that uh, really also teaches law uh, at ASU. Fantastic individual that really not only works in commercial litigation, but it's one of the few people that actually also works in the American Indian tribal courts. That's something that a lot of attorneys don't get to do. Uh, fluent in Spanish and also works in the uh, law firm that he works for, handling a lot of their, um, you know, like training around racism and bias and really kind of moving the agenda forward um, within his own firm. So he really is all about diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And he is going to guide us on our journey for conscious racial uh, and radical equity. So I invite you to join us on December 10th. The link is uh, here at the bottom. It'll be up on our website uh, by tomorrow morning. We already have, don't we already have folks registered, Brent? I think we do. So uh, we do already have some folks registered. I don't remember how many, I mean, but we have a few. Wonderful. Excellent. So that's what we've got. Uh, we are so humbled by you all. Thank you so much. We're grateful for you. Uh, have a blessed and safe Thanksgiving. Enjoy each other. Take a few deep breaths, right? So breathe it in, breathe it out. There you go. Thank you so much for joining us for DLA's Uncomfortable Conversations That Ignite Change. Have a great day.